Hi everybody, this is uh, Mario and I Diamant, and uh, I am very excited about our guest today. Um, his name is Marcus Sheridan, and believe it or not, he sort of uh, gained his marketing chops by initially uh, focusing on marketing and selling his pool business. Um, and uh, since then, which, which he did very successfully, Marcus has moved on and gained uh, quite the reputation in the world of online marketing, community building, sort of with a strong emphasis on selling. And you might know him as the uh, sales lion, I believe. Um, so, so Marcus, super jazzed to have you here on Idea Match. And uh, tell me a little bit about uh, I, when I when I read your bio and I learned about you know your background in the pool business. Tell us a little bit about it, and and more importantly, tell me what got you thinking about marketing and and what did you do? Yeah, man. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm I'm really excited, and uh, like we were saying earlier, I love video, and so this is great. You know, just kind of uh, riffing it and doing off the cuff here for the next half hour, whatever we talk. But you know, yeah, I was a pool guy, and I still own a pool company. We started the company in 2001. Now, what we do is we install in-ground fiberglass swimming pools throughout Virginia and Maryland. Okay. And so we were just, you know, doing our best to, to make things happen for about six years, seven years. And then in late 2008, as you know, the economy just tanked it. And what happened is the housing market crashed, right? So when the housing market crashed, everybody lost the equity that they thought they had in their homes. And the way people pay, pay for swimming pools is through like second mortgages, home equity lines, things like that, right? So immediately in 2008, we were a company that needed to do about 75, 80 pools a year to be successful. And we had, we had been doing that, but now we had about 20% of the same amount of people to choose from when we were in big trouble. We had to do something really drastic in order to extend our reach, but also uh, increase closing rates for sales. And that's when I discovered, it was actually in March of 2009, I was, I was doing research and we were just floundering. I mean, we were, Mario, we were floundering, bro. We were, we were really in big trouble. And, uh, but you know, that's a side point. Oftentimes when we're in our biggest trouble, we're really forced uh, to stretch ourselves and do things we might not otherwise consider, you know? <clears throat> and so that's what happened in this case. I stumbled upon HubSpot's blog. You know, for those that haven't heard of HubSpot, they're really the founders of the phrase inbound marketing. And so I, <clears throat> I started learning about inbound marketing, content marketing, blogging, it made total sense to me. And so, you know, with me and my two business partners, basically what we did was say, hey, you know, why don't we just be the greatest teachers in the swimming pool industry? And so we took every question that we'd ever been asked over the course of like eight years. And dude, if you think about it, I had gone on during this time over a thousand sales appointments, right? I figured this out the other day as I was preparing a, like a, a, a some type of uh, webinar I was giving. So I've given over, been in a thousand homes, right? Talking about swimming pools in the past. I've gotten all those questions from people during that time period. But I've also taken something like 200,000 emails during my time, right? And I think it's something like 400,000 phone calls our business has gotten. Wow. So if you put that all together over the course of like eight years, how many questions have we been asked from consumers? It's a ridiculous number, right, dude? And so we said, why don't we just answer these questions exactly, exactly like the people are thinking it. Let's post that as the title of the blog. So like the first question everybody asked was, how much does a swimming pool cost or how much does a fiberglass swimming pool cost, right? Well, see, nobody in the industry, in the pool industry, wanted to address this idea of cost on their websites, which is crazy to me. It's like fear-based marketing. I'll never understand it. So we were the first persons to write about the subject, how much does a fiberglass pool cost or what's the price of a fiberglass pool? I'm just giving you one example here. And immediately, we got first page for Google on fiberglass pool costs, fiberglass pool prices, fiberglass, anything you type in the search engine right now. You can be in Europe. I think it's still going to come up as number one, bro. Anything you type in, fiberglass pools and costs, we're going to be number one. And the reason is because we were not afraid to address questions that everybody was asking. And so after the first six months, we really started to see a major tick in the traffic. And when within the first year, it exploded and to, to where it is today, which is the most popular swimming pool website in the world in terms of in terms of traffic. 
And it's great, man. It's great. We do not, we eliminated all of our advertising at that point in time, but we've grown our business as the economy has gone way down. So I apologize for the long winded answer, but that's what it did. No, I, you know, I, uh, it's that, that's a pretty gutsy move. You, uh, you know, I mean, you, you sort of got in dire straits and rather than say, you know, more results immediately, everything must be RRI focused. You, you more or less said, you know what? We're going to start being the straight shooters in the industry and we're going to start teaching. Um, man, that takes some balls. Yeah, well, you're right. And I think that's the, you know, in our work, you know, with a lot of businesses now about this, and I find that's the great divide. You know, speaking of, speaking of, of having, having guts, man, you got to, you got to be gutsy with your content marketing, with your blog, right? You have, you cannot live in the world of gray. So you take stands in certain areas. You talk to people that have two mentalities when it comes to blogging, right? The first type, the first group of businesses, uh, well, we're the exception to the rule. That wouldn't work in our industry. And I hear that over and over again, man, which is a joke. Because all these principles apply to every industry I've ever worked in. I don't care if you sell toothpaste. I don't care if you sell swimming pools. I don't care if you sell a service. I don't care if you sell a product. It's all the same thing. The principle is... People have questions. He who answers the questions of the consumers is going to earn their trust. If you start to earn their trust, you can start to push them down the sales funnel more and more and more, especially if you have great content. And that's how it works. I mean, it's really no science. You have a lot of people that try to make content about marketing, blogging, out to be this, this prolific science. It's really not. What it is, if you have the ability to think exactly like a consumer and say, what do they want to hear about? What do they want to talk about? And you answer them really truthfully and honestly, directly. You don't, you call a spade a spade when it needs to be called a spade. You're going to be really successful. Now, if you sit there and you blow smoke all day, it ain't going to work. It just ain't going to work. And so you've got to have opinions. And we took opinions, man. I tell you, we really made waves in the pool industry. And I don't mean that with a pun. We made major waves because I came out and I was going to write about anything and everything. If someone had said to me in a previous appointment, okay, I was looking at this product, this fiberglass pool company, and this company, who do you think is better, right? And so nobody had ever compared brands in our industry, nobody. But everybody asked about brand comparisons, right? They have typed it in the search engine brand comparisons. But see, everybody's afraid. To, to compare two different products. Forget that, man. I mean, if you look at a Ford commercial, what are they doing, actually? They're saying, well, Ford stacks up against the leading competitor, or Ford versus the, the, the Chevy this or that. They're comparing all the time. They've been doing it for years. Why don't bloggers do that? We get asked the questions. Your sales staff gets asked questions all day long. Hey, compare your product with this product. Compare this brand with that brand. Why don't we do it? It doesn't make any sense. We should be doing it all the time. And when we do it, you want to talk about gain and trust, Mario. You become the voice. If you do it in such a way where you call a spade a spade, you got to stay honest, right? You got to stay honest. Because I've told people before, like in my in the in the pool industry, okay. I don't keep going back to that, but it's easy analogy. You got three different types of pools. You got concrete pools, you got fiberglass pools, and you got vinyl liner pools. Those are the three types of in-ground pools. Okay, over there in Europe, you got a bunch of uh, concrete pools. In LA, your other place where you live, it's concrete. But if you go to New York, a lot of people have vinyl liner pools. If you go to the beach like um, Nags Head, Myrtle Beach, there's a lot of fiberglass. And so what happens now as this industry is, has grown so much, people are debating, should I get a fiberglass pool or should I get a vinyl pool? Should I get a concrete pool or should I get a fiberglass pool? Which is better? I'm telling you, Mario, if you go on the search engines right now, and if you type anything about fiberglass versus concrete, fiberglass compared to concrete, fiberglass versus vinyl, Fiberglass compared to vinyl. I don't care. If you're researching, bro, you're going to find one of the articles that I've written. Again, nobody compares stuff because they're not thinking like consumers. So, I, so, so, so basically what you're saying, Marcus, you started writing about the stuff that everybody was asking about, but none of your competition was, was answering because it was this like hidden veil. It's like consumers can't know. You took the bullshit out and you started writing about it. I love that. Um, well, that's exactly right, man. And... To me, it only made common sense, but to so many people, they thought I was nuts. They thought, even still, when I bring up this thing about price, 
um, and, and they're like, yo, you post your prices on your website? I'm like, look, you don't understand. My pools cost from twenty to $250,000. I get big fat ranges on my website, but I address the question. You can't always answer a question specifically. You might not be able to say, yeah, on every pool you buy, you're going to spend $73,000. But you can certainly say, hey, if you're here, I think you're going to be from fifty to $80,000. You know, I've had, I've literally had people call me up over, I mean, this has happened hundreds of times. Mark, thank you for finally answering my questions. I get calls from all over the world. I get calls from Europe. I get calls from Australia. All people saying, <clears throat> you finally answered my question. I couldn't find the answers. Why can't people find the answers, Mario? It's crazy. But it, the, the reason for that is because we're afraid to actually address them. Which is nuts. Let, let, let me ask you this. Um, so obviously, you became you know the, you 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 became the owner of the world's largest pool website, um, which means that your traffic numbers went up significantly. Um, yeah. the, you know the, the the question I'd ask: What about your 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 sales, your leads? Um, because that's what everybody's worried about when they don't that's give up. That's the only thing that matters. That's all that matters. None of this stuff is. It's all for naught. If you don't make sales, just like you can have, and I wrote about this on the sales line this morning, bro, you can have an awesome online community, but if you're in business and that community doesn't equate to sales, you ain't got nothing because eventually you won't have a business. And if you cannot pay your bills, I don't care what type of traffic you have. I don't care what type of interaction you have. I don't care what your cloud score is. None of it matters because you have to be profitable, assuming you blog for a business, not if you're just some person that's looking to make friends. That's different, okay? That's not included here. But you see, the beauty of, see, I use like HubSpot. With HubSpot, I can track every lead, how they came into the system, from what keyword, those leads that turned into sales. I can attribute literally, literally, this is not exaggeration, Mario millions in sales from the blog alone because of tracking keywords, right? I don't actually, there's, to me, there is a strong myth that there's just no way to measure your return on investment with social media. Well, that's bull. You can. You can measure a very strong portion of it. And you just need the proper analytic tools, right? I happen to use HubSpot, but the next Joe might be using some other company out there. But you have to be able to say, okay, this year we had 793 people type in the search engine fiberglass pool cost. And from that 793 people, 70 of them filled out a form on the site and became a lead. And of those 70 that became a lead, we went on 13 sales appointments. And of those 13 sales appointments, we closed eight of them. And those eight that we closed, at an average of $50,000, is $400,000 in sales. With a total profit margin of $150,000 to our company. That's ROI. That exists. I do it every day. So when people say to me, oh, so you spend... Um, on your on your analytics platform, you spend five thousand or ten thousand a year. Isn't that expensive? I laugh, dude. Let me give you this number. When the economy was good, I spent to achieve four million in sales in two thousand and seven. We spent about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, we were doing everything: print, radio, TV, shotgun marketing at its finest, bro, all over the place. Just looking to hit something. Then we couldn't afford to do that stuff because of the economy. But we had to generate more leads than ever. We embraced this concept of inbound and content marketing. And then all of a sudden, things go through the roof. We are able to withstand the economic uh, downfall, windfall. In, in 2011, we did about $5 million in sales. Okay. And we spent about 18000 bucks. On advertising okay that's our marketing budget now if you look at those numbers 
they seem fake, man. They don't even seem real. Because it used to be what was the number back in the day for businesses. Like your total gross sales, you spend like 9 to 13% or whatever it was on your advertising budget. Now I'm spending what? Less than 1%? You know what I'm saying? Less than 1%. And that's possible if you do things right online. But you got to do them right. I mean, it's, it, not everybody's doing it. I mean, there's plenty of people that are blogging. And I mean, they're just doing it wrong, man. They're doing it wrong. and They're not seeing return on investment. They're like, what am I doing wrong? I mean, I get the emails all day long. But that's my goal, of course. I'm trying to educate everybody to this. So be before I, I talk about sort of your new or before you talk about uh, um, your new quest of educating people in marketing, did, did your competition ever follow suit? Did they? <laughs> Dude, this is what's so crazy. I have taught, I mean, literally, for four straight years, I have taught the National Swimming Pool, um, at the National Swimming Pool Conference. I teach to my local competitors everything I've done online. I have a huge amount of subscribers in the pool industry to the sales line where I tell every secret that I've ever done in terms of my marketing. And do you know... I figured out recently, I've probably taught somewhere around a thousand swimming pool companies exactly what I have done to achieve success. And I've seen somewhere between 10 to 15 actually do it kind of well. 10 to 15 out of that thousand. It goes back to Pareto's law, but it's much, much, it ain't 8 to 20 when it comes to the marketing business. And it goes back to that phrase that I always say, Mario. You can take a horse to water, bro, but you can't make it drink. It's the same thing when you're teaching about this stuff. I have been taking people to water in the swimming pool industry, but very few drink. I don't know why. Honestly, I don't know why. Some of it's laziness. Some of it's a lack of passion. For some people, their wallet isn't hurting enough, and so they're not forced to stretch themselves. I don't know, man. That's where we are. Let, who 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 inspired you back then? I mean, I I've interviewed Gary Vaynerchuk, and if I uh, um uh if I were to describe you, and you know, I, I I would be saying that you're doing in the pool industry what you know young young Vaynerchuk was doing in the wine business a few years back. What what inspired you? I know you went to HubSpot and you started checking them out, but is there a person or a book or man? There wasn't anybody. In fact, I'm not trying to put this on myself here because it's funny you mentioned Gary. I never heard of Gary V until one time after I had all the success and started blogging about it. Um, HubSpot asked me to come up there and be on HubSpot TV with them and, and did this interview. And I was just, you know, just my normal self, all happy and fired up. And they're like, do you know who you are like? You're like, you like the Gary V of the swimming pool industry. Yeah. And I'm like, well, who's Gary V? I'm like, you don't know who Gary V is? I'm like, no, I've never heard of Gary V. And so, you know, I went home and, and watched him. <laughs> I started laughing because because he's funny. I really like, I mean, I like the way he communicates. I see the, you know, certainly see the similarities in the backgrounds as well. And of course, I went on to meet Gary. and He's just an amazing guy. But, but the thing about it is, to me, it was common sense. You know, how long, if you look at it, Mario, seven years, I would go to a person's home, sit at the kitchen table, and I'd spend an hour or two teaching them before I could really start the sales process. That didn't make sense to me. It's inefficient. And so when I changed from um, that to, hey, you know what, maybe I can teach them on the front end, I spend less time in the home teaching more time selling. Wow, what a great concept. And so that's exactly what happened. I answered all those questions that I was answering at the kitchen table. I answered it on the site. And I, by the way, that's what the consumer wants anyway. I mean, that's how they, they feel us out is through our content. You know, if we're great teachers, they're going to maybe call us and fill out a form. If we're not great teachers, and see, that's the thing. People that tell me, well, you still don't need a blog to be successful. That's not true. You have to be a great teacher. You have to be a great teacher because that's where we're all headed. Eventually, the teachers will own all their industries. The teachers will. You know, I always make this analogy. 
but I believe it very, very strongly. If I was to start a content marketing business today, the only people I would hire would be kindergarten teachers. That's the only people I would hire. The first reason is because they're underpaid as it is and underappreciated, and I would pay them a lot. But the second reason, and here's the key, is kindergarten teachers all day long, what do they do? They teach four- and five-year-olds how to understand complex principles in a manner that is very easy to understand. They are not interested in hearing themselves talk. They are not interested in using big words. They have to be direct and succinct and very clean with their communication. Who I would not hire would be college professors. Now, granted, there's good college professors, but a, a large portion of them are very technical with the way they speak. They don't always speak at the level of their audience. They're interested in hearing themselves, and they're interested oftentimes in praise. Okay? Now, that's stereotypical statement, but it's, I'm just saying there's a big difference there between the two. The mentality that great bloggers and content marketers have is that of a kindergarten teacher. Their sole goal is that everybody understands what their message is. They're not there to impress. That was our approach. I love it. I love it. I, I'd never heard of that analogy, but I think it's a good one. Um, you, you didn't go to college, did you? Actually, actually, I did. I went to, um, speaking of teaching, I'm a huge sports guy. I went to West Virginia University. Because I got bad grades in high school, and I didn't have to have good grades to go to WVU. And my uncle owned a townhouse next to the football stadium, and I was a huge football guy. And so he said, you can come and live here in the townhouse. And so I went to WVU, and I went there to be a PE teacher. <laughs> a PE teacher. And so my background is actually teaching. That's yeah. what it is. That's great. That's great. I didn't know that. Sorry, I must have overlooked that on your side. I think I was reading through your bio. Um, well, I don't make a big deal out of it because the reality is for me, for the most part, college didn't help me for the future. College didn't, help, didn't teach me how to teach. You know what I'm saying? You learn to teach by teaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's just how it works. I um, mean, I love my time there. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, people need college to be successful. I was talking to my brother the other day, man. He's been in the Army. He's going to retire in a few years, and he's going to start a business. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I think I might go get my MBA. I'm like, dude, you need to go start your business and get your real education. Don't delay it, man, any further. You've got all the, you've got all the education you need, bro. You need to open up that business. You need to go at it aggressively. And that's when you're going to learn and be successful. You know, and I think, I mean, I'm not anti-college, nor am I anti-education. But, I, you know, like Mark Twain says, never let your uh, schooling get in the way of your education. And I think we do that sometimes because your education is solely done by being in the grind. I mean, the people, the reason I think I've been successful with this whole sales line speaking thing is because I've I've lived everything I talk about. You know mm -hmm. what I mean, man? And and it came there's I made way more mistakes than I've um done things really well. You know, but it's it's by that, you know, you make twenty mistakes and then you have that one breakthrough and then all of a sudden people think you're really smart. What they don't see is all those screw ups that you had along the way. But that's what separates the people that are really great and the great teachers from the ones that just kind of talk about it or the folks that just regurgitate Seth Godin's latest book. You know what I mean? There's a big, big difference. So I don't want to hear about Seth Godin's latest book. I love Seth Godin, by the way. I want to hear how you applied the teachings and then tell me about it. So uh, um, I agree. I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, what, what I find astounding is that, and, and I see it all the time, I mean, we, we do a lot of interviews, is that, you know, you're putting this knowledge out there for your competition to, to scoop up and bring to life, and they don't. And you know what? That, that, is, that is one thing that, that I think we need to point out, because people are afraid of teaching because they think that people are going to steal their ideas. I got to talk to you about this, Mario. Here's the deal, bud. I love this subject. It's one I might be more passionate about what you just said than anything. 
people and businesses got to think or got to stop thinking their secret sauce is anything more than Thousand Island dressing because it ain't. That's all that it is. You know, Big Macs, Thousand Island dressing, that's all it is. And you want to talk about McDonald's for a second. Let's talk about McDonald's because I enjoy talking about McDonald's. I enjoy food and I like their French fries, but I really like talking about McDonald's. How many documentaries, TV specials, books, whatever interviews have been done on the business model that is McDonald's? How many, man? How many would you guess? Seriously. A thousand? Two thousand? Ten thousand? Is there anything we don't know about that business? We know everything about that business, man. How many McDonald's do you have, though? One. That's it. One. That's it. You got people trying to copy them all day long, and they haven't come close to attaining their success. It's the same principle for any business. You are the only you. You can teach people what you do all day long, and they can try to do it, and they're going to have a completely different result. So the companies that have tried to copy McDonald's, what have they done? They failed. Every single one of them has failed, or they've changed their business model. Wendy's recently came out with a new campaign because now they're trying to be more like a higher-end burger joint. Why? Because McDonald's was killing them, and they couldn't make a profit. So they got to be their own person. Well, look at that. they got to have their own identity. That's how we all are. So this concept of people are going to steal your secret sauce, that in your secret sauce is so secret, it really doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's just Thousand Island, and everybody knows it. So let let me let me just and and then and then we're gonna move on and we're gonna cover one more topic. Um, but let me let so let me just go back when you when you started doing more and more inbound marketing. You you set up a blog on your pool site. Is that where you posted? I want to get real specific for for yeah, for our audience. You have to, see, and people still ask me about this. You gotta look at a blog. All it is is an extension of your website. This, that's all it is. It's a part of your website. You say a blog. It's really the same thing. Now the blog is the zone, the area where you spend your time teaching people without pitching yourself all day long. In most cases, the rest of your website is where you brag about yourself if you want to. Okay, and you still teach, but that's if you want to brag, you do it on your website. How it works is they come into the top of the funnel with a great blog article. From there, they might fill out a call to action or they might continue to look at other pages. From there, they might look at your company about page and your services page and then set up the appointments, right? And that's coming down to the bottom of the funnel. That's how it works. But much of it starts with your blog because first thing is they want to know if you can answer their question. So you have to set up the blog on your site. And it's got to be readily accessible and available and visible to viewers and search engines. So, so use your blog to post great teaching content. Use the rest of your site. That's where you put your your sales messaging on. But, but you know what? I think you bring up a really important point because I see too many companies and entrepreneurs set up blogs and then they do this bullshit promotional content on their blogs and they wonder why nobody reads them. So I love, I, I love how you're saying, hey, split it up, put on your blog. That's where you teach. On the rest of your site, that's where you position yourself. That's where you sell yourself. Yeah, you know, I mean, rarely ever do I talk about river pools on my blog. I mean, I might say, I met with a customer recently, and this is what happened. And they asked me this question, and this was the answer. But for the most part, it's certainly not about river pools. It's definitely not about specials and, and stuff like that. Yeah, you can go ahead and put a call to action at the end of the post if you want. That doesn't ruin the whole thing. But as a whole, you want it to be very value driven in terms of the information that's on the blog. I see people all the time. They'll, I mean, I consult with people and they come up with these decent titles, right? I get excited about them. And then I read the first draft and I'm like, dude, all you did was pitch yourself. I don't care about you. You didn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. Now write it again and answer the daggum question. Really give me a good answer. What else did you do? Did you get, uh, um, so you started blogging, you started writing, you started getting active. I did video. Video? I did a lot of video. 
Did you start getting active on, on Twitter? I'd be curious. No, I didn't. And I never would. Because, because here's the thing. There's this myth that Twitter works for every industry. It, it is not a strong focus. You see, look at the pool industry for a second. The pool industry is um, for, the, for my business. Somebody buys a pool for me maybe once a lifetime. Lucky, lucky if it's twice, but it's probably just once a lifetime. Those people are not searching on Twitter for a swimming pool. I know. I know. Trust me, I've done the research. It's not prolific. You can, you can type in fiberglass pools on Twitter, and the only people talking about fiberglass pools on Twitter are the companies that are, might be blogging about them. Okay? So it's not prolific usage. And because these, I don't, I'm not a retail company, and so I'm not constantly having customers come back to me. Facebook doesn't work that well either. You see, every platform works better or worse depending on the industry and niche. Somebody once told me, he's like, I don't understand why you're not using Twitter better in the pool industry. I'm like, what are you, silly man? I can be the best in the world at content marketing and blogging. Or I can sit there and try to be a jack of all trades and master of none. And that's what I see all the time. You got a bunch of people trying to open up a Twitter, a Facebook, a LinkedIn, a this and a that account, and blog and do YouTube. And they end up being very average to less than average at all of them. Now, it's different, though, with each industry. With the, with the sales line, I'm talking about marketing, blogging social media, all that stuff. So Twitter and Facebook are a huge part of that. They're a very big part of it. It's a main part of my it's a major part of my business model, right? Because I can't just dominate through search because the competition is greater. The CSI index is greater as I call it. The con the, the content saturation index is much greater in terms of the amount of content in the in, in the marketing and blogging field. And so at that point, you have to have a stronger network. You've got to utilize some of those other platforms. I worked 20 times harder, at least, to do well with the sales line and to get to the point where I am than I did with the pool company. I could dominate the pool industry fast because the CSI the content saturation index was so low that nobody was going to be a good, nobody was teaching well in the industry. But that's available, Mario, still to the majority of businesses out there. If you get outside of, of many of the tech fields, the marketing fields and social media slash blogging fields, and your business is beyond that, there's a good chance you can still dominate very well if you become the best teacher in your industry solely through blogging great content does that make sense absolutely so a lot of your content came a lot of your uh, traffic obviously came from search engines which um which i love i you know i always tell people in most industries um the content that you get from search engines other people who are much closer to buying because they're actually looking at researching purchase decisions Versus, you know, on Twitter, you're you're looking at the latest trends. You're looking at, you know, what's in the news today. So I I I am so Check glad to out. hear that confirmed. Check this out. Real numbers. People like real numbers. I love real numbers. I wrote an article on river pools, and I've got a lot of examples like this. I'm just going to give you one. It got so to date, it's been read over sixty thousand times. Sixty thousand times. And based on my keyword research, I think the one article has made me over $500,000 in sales. Now, if you had to guess about that blog article, how many times do you think it's been tweeted and liked on Facebook and added a plus on G+. How many times do you think, Mario? Take a guess. Uh, let's say on average less than 20. Huh. One tweet. Zero likes, 500,000 in sales. There's this myth going on out there with the many businesses that your stuff has to be shared in order to equate to profit. 
In some industries, yes, but in others, that's just simply not the case. And so if you're focused, that's why these businesses come to me and say, well, I'm not getting a lot of likes and shares on my content. I'm like, well, that doesn't matter to me because all I care about is are you getting enough sales? Because bottom line, we got to turn a profit. That's our it. goal. Here. We got to turn a profit. That might mean we go after Twitter aggressively, and it might mean we never even blink and open up a Twitter account in the history of our business. But what matters is that it works, whichever one we choose, and we turn a profit. I love it. Um, all right. So one of the things that's happened, obviously, is you've, you've switched some of your attention towards the sales line and educating other people on marketing and sales. Um, I get it very clear, your message, hey, go out there and teach. Um, what other advice do you have? And, and now when you give this advice, don't, you know, our audience is not, even though we have them, um, online marketers and bloggers. But, but what other advice do you have for entrepreneurs, for people running businesses like you did in the pool industry? What should they be doing? Okay. I would say the first one, going back to what I said earlier, is we have a huge problem of paralysis by analysis. You got business owners that are so busy reading their 35 blogs that they're not actually doing anything. The first and foremost tip or, or, or suggestion I have for businesses and bloggers is to actually go do something. You have to produce. You have to be a producer. Okay? That means you go out and you write the article. You put your butt in a seat, you open your laptop, and you start typing. Stop reading about it. Okay? Stop reading about it. Um, if you've had an inclination for a while that you need to do video, stop reading about how to make great videos and stop buying great equipment. Go make a stinking video with your iPhone. That's what you really need to do to learn this stuff. You can only learn by doing. It goes back to that ana analogy earlier. We've got a lot of business owners that keep wanting to go to college when it comes to social media. They just keep wanting to learn about it and read about it, but they never want to go out in the real world and do it. The only way you get good at blogging is by blogging. The only way you get good at video is by making videos. You don't get good at stuff by reading about it. Sure, that helps sharpen the sword. I mean, I read as much as the next guy, no question about it. That's number one. Number two, along with that, you cannot be a jack of all trades because you'll end up being a master of none. That's pure and simple. People all the time say, Seth Godin, how come you don't do Twitter? He's like, because I can't be the best at it. That's why I don't do Twitter. And I, last I looked, Seth's doing pretty well. Seth's doing pretty well. This concept that we have to be all places to all faces is total bogus. You've got to know your shtick as a business owner. You've got to know your shtick online. Right? It sometimes takes some time to develop that. Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, he calls it your hedgehog concept. I love that phrase, man. What can you be the best at? Well, see me, when it comes to the pool industry, I could be the best teacher, and I was. Okay? And we had the best blog. When it comes to the sales line, I can be the best teacher with respect to inbound and content marketing and creating conversation and, and really helping people understand that which is which is exactly why I put so much time into it into the ebook and all that stuff. Give it away, baby. All right. But I know what I am. I know what I'm not. You don't see me writing articles about how to create a Facebook page. Because my Facebook page ain't very good. So I'm not gonna write You're not gonna see me a bunch of articles about how I'm not good at LinkedIn. Will I be at some point? Maybe. If I figure it out, then I'll write about it. But I got to get to the grind first. That's my suggestions, man. All right. So the audio broke out a little bit. Go do it. Don't let paralysis by analysis hold you back. And don't be a jack of all trades. And then the third thing, because you've said it loud and clear, is start teaching. Be an awesome teacher. Embrace teaching. Honest, clear, transparent teaching. I call it transparent marketing you just say it like it is man don't hold anything back 
It takes guts. Yes, it does. It absolutely takes guts. I remember, dude, when I first started blogging about brands, I got immediately two letters from lawyers of these national multi-million dollar companies saying, you can't do this. You got to take it down. And I said, well, I only just repeated the information that you all said before. I just compared you with somebody else. And uh, so if you want to roll, let's roll. Now, I mean, I, I didn't have the money to roll with anybody. But they backed down because they, didn't, they knew they didn't have a leg to stand on. It's just what it was. All right. So I, you, you've given great advice. Um, tell me about the ebook you got on your site because I want, I want my audience to go download it. It's like 264 pages or something like that. Tell me what's in it. Yeah. All right, dude. It's, I appreciate that, Mario. It's called Inbound and Content Marketing Made Easy. It's the largest ebook of its kind and it's free. It doesn't cost you money. And it's and it's on my site, of course. If you read this ebook, I'm telling you, you will really you know, we've talked about this stuff today. This will go at another level. You have actionable stuff to apply to your business. All right. And I just really go out. I even talk about HubSpot, but I go all about how to start your blog, how to be great at blogging, brand yourself. And I talk about some other strategies I've done too. You know, talk about secret sauce. That's where I explain every ingredient to everything that I've ever done. And I did that as really, um, it was so many people said, Marcus, dude, you, you give this ebook away. Why are you not selling it? Well, they don't realize it's been downloaded thousands of times. And then I only produced that thing. It's a, it's an anthology of the blog posts that I've written about inbound and content marketing over the course of two plus years. But now it's been downloaded thousands of times and shared and people, the, the amount of emails that, that come in, Mario, are just, just amazing. Talk about Europe. I got one this morning from a guy in Europe, you know, and that's what, what really means the world to me is people are applying the principles and it's changing their life and it's helping them live in financial peace. Ultimately, that's the goal. I love it. So everybody go download that ebook. Um, Marcus's site is a saleslion.com. And, and I'll tell you, I, I mean, I, I am a little bit like you. I, uh, I, I read my fair share, but I don't read too much because, you know, somebody's got to do shit for idea bench. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you've got some, you've, you've got some great stuff on there. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. You were amazingly honest. Like I took down my notes. I learned a lot. Um, I'm gonna let let's. Let, I'm gonna ask you one more question. What what's next for you this year? What what's on your on your plate? You want to do more speaking? You want to move do more marketing teaching? Well, I have moved. Uh, my wonderful business owners have allowed me to, um, you know, spread my wings. I'll be speaking all over uh, North America this year. I might get a, get across the pond maybe. Speaking is what I really love doing, man. I mean, I like writing, but I love I love just getting with a group of people and having a conversation. I'll be speaking at both blog worlds. I'll be speaking at content marketing worlds. I'll be speaking, you know, at tons of events. I'll be speaking in Toronto a couple of times. And, of course, I'll be continuing to write great stuff and pushing the envelope, pushing thought, making people, t you know, uh, addressing subjects in a way that, that people really have to think about it. And some of them are going to be uncomfortable, but I'm excited about it. And, uh, Anything I learn along the way, I'm going to share it, man. So I'm I'm excited about the future, and um, there's going to be a lot more. There's going to be a lot more. You you're going to do amazing things. I know that. So the, here's the thing: the next time you're in Los Angeles, shoot me an email, and uh, I will. we have a good community out there. We'll get everyone together, and I I want people to uh, to know about you. You're doing great work, and uh, thank you very much for doing this interview, thank Marcus. You. Thank all of you all for listening. Really appreciate it.